I told you I'd get you one of them, and I left it at home, so there's yours, buddy. You had a shirt off my back, partner. I ain't never seen me give a shirt off my back. That's lucky, ain't it? I literally just gave you the shirt off my back. That sucker had some fish juice on it over the year, the last couple of years. I it probably smells like it too. So. <laughs> I, I really just did that because now I get a new fresh and clean one for myself. See how I did, uh, yeah. see how I did that? Hey man, appreciate each and every one of you guys for coming tonight. Having my guys that fished with me this morning are here and, and some of the usual suspects here and some new ones, new faces that we haven't seen. I know I've seen your name a lot, Casey, on the, on the YouTube comments and everything and I sure appreciate it more than I could ever tell you, buddy. So thank you very much. And glad you got to come out to one of these. I'm happy to meet you guys. Um, here at Lake Fort Marina, do them every two weeks, every other Friday night, free seminars. Got my man, David Ozio, in the house tonight. Mr. David has been a guy out here for a long time. Great fisherman, a lot of knowledge in his head. And we're going to, I'm going to dig into a topic tonight. Um, I did a video on it in detail, instruction video on the Guys Network episode a couple weeks ago, or week before this, last week, I guess. I don't know, man. I've been fishing too much, running the roads too much. My mind's kind of, as far as that goes. But recently, um, probably over the years, there's not another technique that's caught more double-digit fish in the winter months across the planet Earth, let alone Lake Fork in East Texas, than the old flipping jig. Uh, a jig catches a lot of big fish in the wintertime. Anywhere you go in the country, even up north, when it gets brutally cold up there, they'll throw a finesse jig and catch big fish on those. And so tonight I'm going to break into just wintertime jig fishing overall. We're going to talk about finesse jigs. We're going to talk about flipping jigs. We're going to talk about different sizes, colors. When do I change colors? What makes me change colors? I'm going to try to really get in depth. And if you guys have questions at any time on anything I'm asking you, a why, what, when, how, whatever it is, something you don't understand about why I said something, just uh, shout it out, man. It's pretty pretty free form, public form type situation. So uh, brought some gear for us to look at tonight. So we're going to talk about jigs. You know, the standard, we'll start with kind of the, the standard around here, uh, black and blue. You know, there used to be a deal that I used to look up, and I hadn't looked it up in years, um, but you could look up the list of share lunkers, okay? And it, it would tell you what date they were caught, and a lot of times it would tell you what bait they were caught on, on the list of share lunkers, I believe, on Texas Parks and Wildlife's website. Um, and I can't tell you how many of them sharing lunkers. It just really stood out. I remember this, this you know, years ago when I looked at that, this standing out in my head. Well, first, how many came from Lake Fork? That's obvious, right? Like we have half of the sharing lunkers that have ever been donated in the state of Texas have come from one lake. That was pretty crazy. Um, but the thing that stood out more than anything else was how many were caught during winter months on a black and blue jig. It just said black and blue jig, black and blue jig, over and over and over and over. And these are 13 pound fish. These are once in a lifetime. Like if you're lucky, these are once in a few lifetimes. Not once in a lifetime. Most people aren't ever going to catch a 13 pound bass. Most people that bass fish will not catch a 13 pound bass in their lifetime. I have not witnessed a 13 pound bass in the boat yet. I've seen some that I'm 99.9% .9 sure where that come un come unbuttoned just twice. But uh, it, it's, it's a special, special deal to catch that fish and have that many fish get caught on one technique. There's no other technique that's that close. It, it kind of, to me, says all that you need to know about should I fish a black and blue jig in the wintertime. It, it really does. And so I have, over the years since I read that, have pretty faithfully and sometimes idiotically at times when I shouldn't be fishing it, have fished a black and blue jig in the wintertime a lot because of that. Um, I'll stick with it sometimes when, you know, we're not getting nothing. I'll just keep going because I know, you know, just the odds say there's a good chance to catch a big and so... I saw uh, a guy on there answer, ask a question. It just flashed. It was Morse code. Where do you fish this jig? Where do we fish this jig? Well, we're going to dig into all of that tonight. So I'm going to talk about the jig for a little bit first and kind of how I set it up. And then we are definitely going to break into where and all that good stuff. Now, the jig that I prefer to fish is the Six Sense Fishing Hybrid Jig. Um, there's a lot to the most important thing when you're picking a jig. And I'm not telling you to go buy this jig. I'm just telling you what I use. Um, there's a lot of good jigs on the market, but one thing that you need to really, really consider when you're purchasing a jig is going to be the head design. The shape of the head is so important when you're jig fishing. And I'm going to tell you, first thing is, wintertime you don't get a lot of bites, right? So every bite counts. And when you're fishing a jig, you catch big fish in the wintertime. Boy, that bite really counts when it's a big one in the wintertime. 
So you want to make sure that you hook as many of them in the perfect place as you can. Uh, there's a lot of jigs that are real popular on the market today and they're like, hey, look at our jig in the water tank and it stands up and it stands the bait up straight and the little claws wiggling. That's great. I'm glad. When I hook him, am I going to land him? That's more important. Okay, because all them jigs that are moving on the bottom and, you know, the baits will carry some buoyancy to them and it'll kind of pop that crop and then let him fall. And it's not like you're just leaving this jig dead still like they do in that tank. You're moving it. So that bait's going to get up and get down. Jigs that are taller than they are wide, okay, think about this in your head now. If this jig had a flat side going this way and it had a narrow side right here and had a flat spot on the bottom so it would stand up and it had height going this way on the sides, when that fish bites that jig, when you go to hook him, that skinnier side of that jig is going to want to come out flat out of his mouth, and that jig is going to turn to the tend to turn to the side when you set the hook. So that jig is going to be in here, and as you pull out, as it comes free from his lips, it's going to turn to the side, and you're going to hook him right here. And right there is not a good place to hook a fish. You want to hook him in the top. Uh, and, and the reason that I picked this jig right here now the problem. Okay, I'm going to try and tighten this up because I'm kind of scatterbrained going everywhere right now. That's obviously a problem. Now, you could go to an Arky style jig. An Arky style jig is a great jig for hooking fish. It will hook them and it will land them. It is a, an Arky, an old Arky style jig is great. An Arky style jig has a real wide flat head and not very tall at all. Well, that jig's gonna wanna come out straight up and down. Okay, and that's gonna hook them in the top of the head a high, high, high percentage of the time. That's exactly what you want. Problem is an Arky style jig is gonna get hung up in everything you put it in. And out here, we like to fish heavy timber, root systems on creek channel bends, brush piles, all these kind of things that we like to fish in the winter. Fish get buried up down in that heavy cover down deep. You put that Arky jig in there, you'll spend most of your time breaking off jigs and retying or digging them out or whatever. Uh, so you have to find a blend. You have to find the right marriage of will this jig hook the fish in the right place and will this jig come through cover. Now, this is a pretty unique head design. And that's the reason I choose this jig is the head design alone is the reason that I'm so devout about this, this jig. If you look at it, we'll pass it around and let you guys look at it. When you see this jig, you'll see there's a little bit of curvature on the bottom, but the big deal is it's wider than it is tall. And then there's angles on the head, right? There's angles on the head. And so what happens is that jig is going to hook that fish from there to there. And I can accept anything from that angle to that angle is how that jig is going to want to come out of his mouth. Uh, and sometimes it'll come out straight because this bottom is the widest part. It'll come out straight in the middle sometimes, a lot of the times. Um, but it's going to stay in that upper part of the fish's mouth as it comes, as you jerk on it and pull it out. So the other thing is with these different angles on here, it's not near as bad about hanging up. It won't hang up in the wood. You know, those tall, skinny stand-up jig heads, the ones that are taller than they are wide, they come through cover real good because they go like this. They go whoop and roll right over. Well, this jig has enough angle to get the jig to roll and work through heavy cover and those V's. The V's are the deal that always hang you up in these brush piles and everything, root systems and all that. And, and this has enough angle to kind of roll as it comes through there and get through that cover efficiently. Very, very weedless jig. I, I've, I've had this allotment of jigs for almost <clears throat> two, like a year and a half now, and I'm still on the same allotment. That tells you how few jigs that I lose I have. You'll see some paint missing off this one. I have some of these jigs that I have tied on poles at the house that, I mean, they're my favorite just because they've caught a lot of fish. I mean, I've had them forever and ever. they got no paint left on the head. I've just had to change the skirts out on them because the fish have chewed the skirts off. That's how long I've had it. That's how weedless that jig is. So, um, yeah, check that head design out. We'll pass that around. But that's the reason that I choose the hybrid jig from Six Sense Fishing because it's the best blend of being weedless and hooking the fish in the right place. And that's what you want to look for, whether it's that jig or a Strike King jig or a Santone jig. You know, Santone jig is a, uh, <coughs> what's that jig model of Santones everybody likes so much? It's good. It's kind of got that flatter bottom, got that angled top similar to that one. I don't know very much about the Santones. I can't uh, remember the name of I'm more, I know the structure jigs. Yeah, that's a, that Santone jig, that they, their main flipping jig, I think it's called just the Santone rattling jig, but it's another really good one. Another Texas company makes a good jig. Uh, very similar head design to that actually um, So that's how you pick a jig look at the head design. Hey There's you have a hard time finding a jig that puts a bad hook in it anymore That problem's been solved many moons ago by a lot of different jig companies So you don't really have to worry about well is this guy is this jig they all pretty much have good hooks now um, The big deal is the head design now <clears throat> black and blue jig That's a swim jig that's a jig head. 
get one out that's brand new. Look at here. It's a brand new one, Dave, right there. All right, so when you get a jig and it's brand new, what do I do with it to make it different? Well, in the wintertime, I do a couple things, and I didn't bring my scissors, and I should have. In the wintertime, I do two things <clears throat> to a jig to make it the way I want it. The first thing that you guys need to know is, you know, wintertime fish can be a little finicky and, and tend to nip at the, the tail end of the, the bait a little bit and maybe not bite real aggressive. And so I like to make my jig as compact as possible. I don't want a big bulky trailer hanging down low. I don't want a lot of skirt hanging down low. I don't want to give that fish an option to just bite the back end and miss the hook. So I'll actually take, I'll take the skirt and I'll bunch it up and I'll put my finger right there even with the bend. I'll put my, the tip of my thumb even with the bend of that hook and I'll take scissors and just nip that sucker down right there real nice and tight. I've got one over here that's a different color that has been done that way and I'll show you guys. But that's the first thing I'm going to do is trim that skirt way down to where that skirt is dead even with the bend of that hook down there. Now that one's been bit and pulled, some of the skirt's been pulled down so it's not just dead even. When I start, I trim that skirt dead even with the bend of that hook tight like this so that when you let it go, the skirt actually pops up above the bend of the hook a little bit. Um, the second thing I do is I trim the weed guard. And the six inch jigs come really, really close to perfect out of the package for their weed guard. Uh, most jigs will come with that weed guard will be a little bit longer. If you push that weed guard down, okay, that weed guard should be even with this bar right here on your hook. Most weed guards will come about a quarter of an inch, half an inch past that bar. Uh, you want to trim that down for two reasons. One is any weed guard that you have going past that bar is not protecting anything. It's just a waste of weed guard. It doesn't help make your jig any more weedless. It doesn't do it. There's nothing positive that it brings to the equation. The one thing it does do is it makes your weed guard longer, which makes it less stiff, which makes your jig less weedless. So it's counterintuitive, but a longer weed guard is less weedless than a short weed guard. As long as the weed guard still covers the point of the hook and you want it to go right, you can see I got it right dead even with that barb on that hook. Um, that's where you want your weed guard trimmed. And when you trim it, it'll make that thing stiffer and it'll tighten up and it'll be a better weed guard for you in the long run anyway. So that's the two things I do with the jig out of the package. Um, now we got to get a trailer on there. Got to fish the jig with the trailer at all times. <clears throat> so you got to decide on a trailer. And I've got a couple different trailers here that I'll use. Basically, there's two different styles. And these are both new six cents fishing plastics. But again, these are what I'm using and I'm going to show you what I'm using. But don't take this to mean that you can't use a raised crawl or a chigger crawl or a, you know whatever your brand preference may be. All right, so this is going to be the stroker crawl and the prawn. Basically, I use a crawl style bait and I use a beaver style bait. Thank you, sir. And these these new baits are just about to hit the market for six cents in December, so they'll be available soon. But this is my crawl style bait that I like to use and. You know, um, rage crawls are good, but in the winter time, to me, rage crawls can be a little bit too active, right? I actually like jigs that have thin appendages in the winter time, and the reason why is because when we fish this jig, it's moving, but it's moving very, very, very slow. And so if you have a bigger, bulkier appendage, it takes more water pressure to make that thing kick and move. If you have a thinner appendage, it takes less water pressure, less move it, to put action on that appendage on your creature bait that you're using as a trailer. Um, so the stroker crawl is really good. You can see it, basically these tails do this when you pull it, which creates a swimming motion similar to a uh, speed crawl type of deal. But at the same time, it folds up nice and tight when it's at a standstill and looks like a little crawl bait. And those thin appendages, even when you're barely moving it in that water, they'll get a little bit of an undulation, just a little bit of a movement to them, uh, sitting almost dead still, just barely moving them in calm water. Uh, so I really, really like the stroker crawl. I think it's a great all-around bait. I think it marries, again, marries the best of both worlds, where it will swim when you move it fast, and it'll still have action when you move it real slow. Uh, when they designed this bait, when I first laid eyes on it, I said, man, that's a home run. That is the best jig trailer bait I've ever seen in my life. It's a great standalone creature bait to flip, but this is, to me, the best jig trailer bait I've ever seen. It does everything you want out of a jig trailer. Now, the other bait that we will use, and again, this is gonna be contrary to what you would think, what common sense would tell you, but we'll use a beaver style bait. This is the Prom by Six Cents, um, but it's pretty, pretty typical, pretty normal beaver style bait. When would you think I would use a bait with no kicking legs? 
When do you think we'd change to that trailer? Fall quicker. Boy, you smart. Most people think you're going to go to a bait where the legs don't kick when you want to fish the bait even slower. That's not the case. You want to go to a bait where the legs don't kick when you want it to fall faster and create more of a reaction bite. Okay? Which I was going to say by flipping wood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's going to be for flipping wood. It's going to be, yeah, that's all part of the equation. But, yeah, when you want the bait to fall faster, that's when we go to the product. We're going to talk about where we fish it and how we fish it and all that here in a minute. Um, but that's how I decide which two baits I'm going to use. Most of the time it's going to be that stroker cross style bait. But when I really want that bait to shoot down into those root systems or shoot down into that brush pile and fall real quick, create a reaction, then I'm going to go to a beaver style bait like the prong. All right, rods and reels. <clears throat> very, very important. A rod is probably the most important part of the equation when you're jig fishing in the wintertime because these bites can be, sometimes the bites can be real aggressive in the wintertime. Believe it or not, they will, there are times when they will rattle you guys on your rods on a jig bite in the wintertime. There's a lot of times though when it's a very, very subtle bite. So having, uh, it can be hard again it's going to be a lot of blending the best of both worlds tonight is what you're going to hear from me it can be hard to find a rod that's big enough and heavy enough to pull an eight nine ten pound fish up out of a brush pile or a root system you got to have a big rod to do that big line it can be hard to find a rod that can handle that load and be as sensitive as you need it to be for jig fishing so when i'm fishing a, a flipping jig uh, i'm using the seven seven heavy century series from six cents i'll pass this rod around you can put it in your hands and just keep in mind this is a 7.7 heavy and you will be blown away at how light this rod is right here. Most of the weight that you feel is going to be right there on that jig. You can't even feel the weight of the rod, so I'll pass that around. But the sensitivity in your rod is so important when you're jig fishing because of those subtle bites. Now line, I'm going to use 20 pound fluorocarbon line at all times. Uh, braid would be a great line to use for wintertime jig fishing. The problem is we fish it around a lot of wood and braid is no bueno around wood. Braid will hit that wood and make noise as your line drags across it. It will cut grooves in that old soft wood in an old mature lake like Lake Fork or most of these lakes right here. Um, and when it starts easing that groove into that wood, you get hung up a lot more often and you gotta deal with that. So braid is a no-go for wood for me, um, but the sensitivity of braid would be great. So we go to the next best thing. Fluorocarbon has much less stress than mono. Use big heavy fluorocarbon that's pretty stiff. Uh, I'm using Seaguar 20 pound fluorocarbon on, my, on that deal. Uh, reels, you got to have a high speed reel. Okay. He fished with it this morning. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's kind of why I, think, I was looking at yeah. it like, why are you looking yeah. at it? He fished with it too. That's right. So, they were just being polite. They were just being polite. Uh, Thank you. <clears throat> reels, high speed gear issue. Got to be. Got to be. Uh, a lot of times you're not fishing this bait real far from your boat. You're pitching the timber and you're right there. And when you set that hook on that fish, you're setting it up and he's going to want to come up naturally anyway. And you got to be able to pick that line up real quick. When he's coming straight up and he gets too close to you real quick, you better pick that line up in a hurry. So uh, you should never, ever, ever, never in the wintertime move your flipping jig with your reel handle only to reel it in or reel a fish in. You should never impart action on your jig with your reel handle in the wintertime. You should always move the bait with your rod tip and pick up your slack with your reel handle. That's all you're doing, picking up slack with your reel handle until it's time to reel it in, make another cast, or reel it fishing. That's very important. Uh, you will also, if you're moving a bait with, with your reel handle, you don't have the sensitivity you do as when you're moving it with your rod tip. You don't feel it as well. It's important to feel it at all times. So, that is the setup. Um, let's dig in a little bit before we move on to, because I know you want to get to this, but before we move on to the types of areas that we're fishing this and how we're fishing it in that cover and all that. Let, let's, let's dig in a little bit deeper on color selection, <coughs> size selection, because there is another jig that we fish uh, in the wintertime and it gets fished on a lot of lakes, especially for our DFW people out there watching, you have a lot of water to fish this, this other technique in. Um, but we'll, I'll start this by saying that out here, most of the time I'm using a half ounce black and blue flipping jig in the winter vast majority of the time. Um, if I'm confident, if I've been catching fish in the creek channel and I know there's fish in that creek channel, I'm not getting bit on my half ounce black and blue, the first thing that I will do is not change color, but I will, <clears throat> I will actually go up to a three quarter ounce jig and I will change to the prawn as my trailer, to the, the beaver style bank, and I'm trying to get that jig to fall super fast. So I'll go up to a three quarter ounce jig in the middle of winter time. That's another thing that's kind of contradictory to common beliefs, I'll go up to a three quarter ounce jig 
and put a beaver style trailer on there so that, that jig falls super fast and I'm trying to make those fish react that I know we're in there. If I know those fish are in that channel and they're not biting my normal thing, I'll throw this and try to zip it by their head and make them snap at it. When you get them biting that, that's that boom. I mean, that's a hard bite when you get those bites. You don't have to worry about being real sensitive in that situation because when that thing zips by their head and they're biting it like that, they're biting it real hard. Um, so that will be the first thing I try. If that doesn't work, I'll go back to my half ounce and change colors. Well, if I'm not throwing black and blue, okay, what am I throwing? And the answer is pretty simple. It's green and brown. Uh, it can be any combination of green and brown you want it to be, green and orange, whatever you want to call it. Um, it just, I call it a natural color. Now, black and blue is not really what color these, like, people think when you're fishing a jig, you're imitating crawfish. They all make the assume you're imitating crawfish. I think sometimes we overthink what we're imitating. I think you need to get general size right. I think you need to get, uh, <coughs> I think you need to fish colors that they can see sometimes. If the water's real clear, yeah, you need natural colors. Uh, but black and blue jig, when you're fishing it in deep creek bends and stuff that we usually are fishing it in the wintertime, black and blue works because in that deeper water, that hard profile, that solid color, that black shows up real well. Uh, crawfish, actually, until we start getting into January, February, kind of pre-spawn time, crawfish in this area in November, December, are actually green pumpkin and pumpkin seed in color. They're green and brown. That's what color they are. They're green and tan. And most crawfish across the country have a green and tan color to them. The vast majority of them do. And you'll hear, if you if you talk to any touring professional and you ask him, hey, what do you think about a, a green pumpkin and orange jig? They'll tell you it works everywhere across the country. And that's why. Because craw, freshwater crayfish across this country, they're not red most of the time. I know in Louisiana where we eat them from, they're red. But most of the places you go, these crawfish are not red. Uh, they do get some blue hints to them. A lot of them do at certain times of year, especially in the color time of year. But for the most part, most of the year, those crawfish are a green pumpkin and a pumpkin seed type color, green and brown. So that's the color I go to. This right here is called crawfish drone. Uh, grass mutant is another color in the six inch hybrid jig that I really like. Um, and I'll just switch to that green and brown. And then if that fails in, in my, my normal creek channel jig fishing, I'll go down to three eighths ounce and try to get a slower fall. So I'll just try those you know, upsize, change color, downsize in that order to try and get bites. If all that fails, then I go to a different creek channel and don't come back there for a week. <laughs> that's how that goes. Uh, so that's how I decide colors. I start with black and blue always. Once the water gets down below where it is right now, like we're kind of, we're right at that switching point for me to where I really start leaning on that black and blue jig. When you get below 60 and get down into the 50s, we're between 58 and 60 right now on Lake Fork. As we get down towards 55, I'll for sure be locked in on black and blue first. And then if I know the fish are in there and that doesn't work, then I change to green and brown. That's how I pick my colors. Um, the other deal is a finesse jig. A finesse jig is a great bait in the wintertime and it's very versatile. You can fish it on, you know, riprap corners. You can fish it on dam riprap. You can fish it uh, in shallower creek channels. You can fish it around the edges of shallow grass. It's a very, very versatile and very effective bait throughout the wintertime in almost any situation you want to put it in. Um, the colors that I use on finesse jigs, very similar. I will tell you this, there's something to, there's something to, <laughs> funny story, these are ball head finesse jigs. This right here is a Santone Texas finesse jig. This right here is the Ike mini flip or something like that finesse jig. Um, there's something to that round shape of that head and see we have flipping jigs and then we have football jigs and we call football jigs we call them football jigs because the head is shaped like a football so years ago my son loves to play when he was a baby he'd play tackle box and pull my baits out in the living room and he'd sit there and play with them on the floor you know and he had his own little tackle box that were baits that I'd given him to play with and uh he asked me what that jig was. I said, son, it's a football jig. He goes, oh, okay. Well, is this a soccer jig? <laughs> so the ball head finesse jig in my boat and in my house, that's the soccer jig, y'all, in case you didn't know. Right there. So a little story there for you. But again, finesse jig, I'll trim the skirt right to the bend of the hook like I've done this one. This one's one I've fished with recently. Trim the skirt right to the bend of the hook, and I'm going to use a, a mini beaver-style trailer. I use a little bitty... Uh, 
the Strike King rodent, the baby rodent, is the one that I use mostly. And I use the same color combinations, black and blue first, uh, black, brown, and amber, or, or green and brown, some type of color like that, more natural color second. The setup that I fish this on, and I've got my 3 8 ounce tight on this one right now, so don't pay attention to that, but the setup that I throw this one on, again, is going to be a Century Series rod because these are the most sensitive rods I've ever fished, and that's important in jig fishing. But this one's going to be a 7 1 medium heavy. I like to fish an eighth ounce. I like to fish an eighth ounce finesse jig. If I'm going to throw a finesse jig, I want to be finesse with it. So I throw an eighth ounce or a 3 16 uh, If that, I will go 3 16 sometimes, but right around that eighth ounce mark is what I want to fish on a finesse jig. 7 1 medium heavy. There's another rod in the Century Series, 7 4 medium heavy if you like to have a little bit longer rod. Uh, but this is enough rod on a smaller jig like that. This is basically like fishing a light Texas rig as far as hook setting power and landing ability. The other thing that I like to do that's very important to me when I'm fishing <clears throat> an 8 ounce finesse jig is I got to go down to 15 pound line. Uh, that 20 pound line will just overpower that 8 ounce jig head and you just won't feel it. Like you'll lose your feeling for it. You'll lose, you won't be able to feel that bait the way you need to work through cover. Uh, so I have to go down to 15 pound line tops. When I'm fishing an eighth ounce jig, even 12 pound at times, I will go down to if I'm having trouble feeling it. Um, that being said, you just got to know what you're doing and think, think consciously when you decide to take that finesse jig, if you're going to take it and put it in a brush pile, which is not the worst thing to do on earth as far as getting bites go, you just have to beware when you set that hook. If it's a big one, you got to know this is 15 pound line, this is not my normal jig setup, and, and you got to kind of play accordingly. Uh, and not just get in such a big hurry to horse that fish to the boat and man on him because you'll get your heart broke doing that. You'd be amazed how big a fish will come up and bite a little tiny jig. I mean, that finesse jig is a little bitty profile, dude. When you put that baby beaver on there, it's a, it's a tiny little bait. Uh, but some big, big, big fish will bite that in the wintertime at times. You know, these lakes that we have in DFW, like Lake Louisville and Lake Ray Hubbard, everybody loves to crank that riprap. What happens when you got a dead calm day in the middle of the winter and you're cranking that riprap and you can't get a bite? That finesse jig will catch their rear ends in that situation. It's a really, really good bait, especially on calm days in the wintertime. Even some of these shallower creek channels, you know, I don't like fishing a finesse jig in these creek channels that are over 20 foot deep. But some of these eight to 12 foot creek channels, when I can't get a bite, and I know I'm pretty confident there's fish in there, I've been catching fish in there, that finesse jig has saved my rear end out here on days when I'm struggling on those mid to shallow depth creek channel bends out here as well. So that's all the different gear. That's kind of how I decide which ones I'm going to throw. Uh, is there any questions on any of that before we move on? No. Why y'all looking at each other? I know you got questions. You asked 800 of them this morning. <laughs> I got it all out of the way this morning. You got it all out of the way this morning? <laughs> well, all right. All right. So, yeah. Why why do you trim them down to the bend of the hook? Okay, yeah, that is a specific I tr I want to trim them as short as I can trim them and, and and uh I want the bait to be as compact as possible because I want oh, I to give them as little bait as possible below the bend of that hook to bite. Because if you give them more bulk behind that hook, they can bite it and not get the hook and then you set the hook and miss them because in the winter time they don't always bite really aggressively. <laughs> So I want I just want the whole bait to be as compact as possible. One thing that I didn't touch on that I do is I also trim my trailers. Uh, you have to trim these trailers now that I'm using. Uh, even on, on that finesse jig on the on the, the baby beaver, you have to trim it down. So if you'll look, what I actually do. Hold that for a second if you would, sir. Thank you much. Alright, so here's the stroker crawl out of the package. Here's the stroker crawl I've got on that 3 8 ounce jig right there. If you look at these two baits, not only have I trimmed the top off, but I trim a little bit on the sides, an angle on the sides right here. And the reason I do that, I'll show you right now. The reason I'll do that, first thing I do is basically I'll measure this stroker crawl. And what I want to do is I want the bend of this hook because my skirt comes to right here, right? We know that. So I want <clears throat> right here where my appendages start, that's where I want this bottom, this first bend of this hook to come out. I want the appendages to start right where the skirt ends. Makes the bait as compact as it can get. So I'll kind of line up where that is, and then I'll hold right up there next to the collar. Okay, now I'll take my scissors and trim this. That's how we get the height trim. Then I'll trim these angles off the sides, and I'll put this on here and show you why. So as I put this bait on here, 
Try to get it nice and straight, no promises. When I put this bait on here, when you let that skirt fall, see how that skirt lays nice and natural, looks normal as it's swimming through the water? Well, if you don't trim that angle, if you don't trim an angle off the side of that bait, if you just cut that bait off right here like this and leave it that wide, it's going to make that skirt kick out real funny. And that skirt's going to be all wonky. And even when you swim it through the water, that skirt's going to be bowed out. It's not ever going to collapse and flow and move like something natural in the water would. So that's why I trim it this way and then I trim an angle off each side. Also, too, when you, when you look at the profile here, you, you want that skirt, skirt short enough that, say for example, see these appendages on this? They need to catch the draft of the water yeah. in order to have some movement to the tail. So if you had this skirt a little bit longer down there, the water would just simply scoop by the skirt and it wouldn't give any action to the trailer. Now, that doesn't come into play when you're using the beaver style bait that he's talking about right. where you want something to just fall really quick going down there. So you could get away with it on that, but we all do it this way right here in order to give uh, the most action to the trailer. And then also if we put the, the beaver style bait on there, it's just gonna help it fly down on, on quick motion. And I brought this jig in here because this is one of my three quarter ounce jigs that I fish in the summertime. And I leave that full skirt, full size trailer. So much more bulkier, big profile. And you can kind of see if you hold these two jigs up next to each other, how much more that fish can bite below the bend of the hook and grab. And you'll also see that skirt comes into play pretty close to right where the appendages start once again. Now, I just left this one full size. I didn't trim it down at all. This is just a normal stroke of crawl on here. But uh, this is how I fish it in the summertime out deep. I'll drag this, swim this, stroke this off the bottom in the summertime to catch offshore fish. But that, that's how much different the jig can look, the profile size can look. These two jigs, when they come out of the box, look pretty darn similar. Uh, but right now, hold it up one more time there. Right now, you can see how much smaller that profile and compact that profile is on that jig. Mm -hmm. Big difference. I do have a question. Yes, sir. Do you ever trim the weed guard? Uh, yep. Yeah, I usually do it a little bit different. I'll take in on most all jigs, I'll trim the weed guard at an angle. I'll put the scissors this way, I'll spread it out a little bit more, and then I'll trim it this way. But it, exactly to what he's saying <coughs> is that I'm going to press it down to where it just barely covers up the hook. But it's more Bar. of a 45 yeah. degree angle is the way that I'll trim them. It's still enough to deflect it. Sure. So the deal is getting it even with the barb. Yeah. This little <coughs> part right here, this barb right here, you want that to be dead even. Anything past that is a waste of space, and the shorter you get that weed guard, the stiffer it'll be, and the better it'll perform. All right. So, any more questions on the setup of the equipment? All right. Now, 27,000 acres out here, where are you going to go locate a fish in the winter time when you're not going to get many bites and you got to have confidence you're fishing in the right area. Um, the big thing out here over the years has been the creek channel bends. There's other places to fish jigs in the winter time that will work out here. But the big deal, the most popular deal, and for me the most effective and consistent is without a doubt being creek channel bends. Uh, creek channel bends are where the, you know, before the lake was built there was a creek that flowed through there and winded around. And when that creek made a bend, that water flowed up against that bend, and that outside bend always got washed out from that water making that turn. So the outside bend will have the sharpest drop possible, basically like a, a bluff wall. Uh, it's not a bluff wall like you boys are from Arkansas. Some of the lakes up there, you have real bluff walls. Uh, these are mini bluff walls. They might only be three foot, four foot, five foot, six foot. That's about the biggest one you'll find out here that we're going to catch fish in. But it's just a straight drop off and that's important in the winter time because as water temperatures change day to day in the winter time sunlight penetration all that these fish want to be able to change depth as effectively as possible especially these big fish big fish are real lazy uh, if you ever seen a true giant bass even when they're up shallow and spawning and you put your, you run your boat right up on top of them they don't really get in too much of a hurry them little ones will fly out of there like a rocket when you get too close to them them big ones will just kind of wander they're lazy. It takes a lot of energy for them to move all that weight, and, and they are, their whole purpose in life is to take in as much energy as possible through eating and ex expel as little as possible through what they do. That's why big fish will sit in one spot, and that's why these bluff walls are so effective because they can go and go up and down, and the standing timber on the edge of these bluff walls is even better because now they can go all the way up to right on the surface of the sun if they want to on that tree 
and go all the way back down the bottom of that channel. Also, on those outside bends out here in East Texas in particular, we have what's called the live oak tree. And the live oak tree, the biggest, most mature live oak trees, will grow on creek bends and creek channel edges. And the reason they do is live oaks are some of the biggest trees we have in these woods. They're the biggest tree we have in these woods. The tallest is a pine tree, but they are the biggest. Um, and they, they hold their leaves longer throughout the year than any other tree in this area, which means they need more water than the other trees in this area. So big, huge, mature live oaks will always grow right on the edge of a water source, which in this area is creek channels. Well, big, huge, mature live oak trees have big, like big as that couch over there, root systems. And where that creek washed up against the edge of that channel and that live oak tree grew right there, those roots hang out over that creek channel bend. It got washed out. Those roots got washed out. Well, now we fill the lake up. So now you've got this bending mini bluff wall, and now you've got these root systems, basically mini brush piles that overhang the ledge. They overhang the bluff wall. Well, that's a, that's a, I mean, you think about that. If you found a sharp, straight drop-off ledge out here on the main lake and you saw a bunch of brush piles sitting right hanging over the edge of that bluff, you'd be like, oh, boy, huh, that's something special. Well, there's miniature versions of that all over these lakes. Um, and that, to me, is the best place to fish this deal. And, and we're going to put that jig right in those root systems and let it fall down into that channel off the edge of those root systems. So that is how we locate them. Now, one thing you can do right now, it's a great study. This is a great tip. Uh, maps will never, ever, ever, no map will be 100% exact on the actual line of that creek bend. You know, you've got two, in those creeks they do this, they widen out around a bend or sometimes they're narrow around a bend. You'll never have the exact deal. When you're trying to hit a root system, one root system on a tree, your cast needs to be on the spot, on the spot, on the spot. So it's important to be very precise with knowing where these bends are in these creeks and here's here's a good way to tell without a map you don't even need electronics to find this uh, if you can get outside and get in the woods it helps the reason that this is effective for me and that I can do this so efficiently is because I grew up outside in the woods of East Texas uh, but if you can get outside and get in the woods and go look at a creek channel and spot the difference between a live oak tree and a red oak tree, and all these other trees, you know, that we got out here, cedar trees sometimes. Um, spot the difference between those. You'll notice how big that trunk is, what that bark looks like, all that stuff. Well, right now, the lake's a couple feet low, almost, what, two, over two feet low? Yeah, two yeah. and a quarter. So you can see the tops of a lot of these trees. You're starting to see the tops of these trees. And if you'll look, you, if you'll look in an area where your map kind of tells you, okay, there's a creek channel over there, you'll start to notice these live oak stumps and you say and you'll kind of if you look at them you'll kind of see a, oh, there's a line going that way and then it turns back that there's your bend you can see that line of live oak trees going down that creek and winding through that cove or whatever creek along and you can really if you can learn to identify those big live oak trees you can be you can know where every outside bend on that stretch of creek is and know exactly where it is without a doubt like no questions asked